Nabokov's critique of pedophilia included throwing several barbed comments in the direction of the famous Victorian writer, the Reverend Charles Ludwig Dodson, better known to many as Lewis Carroll. Dodson is the author of two famous children's tales, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. The two stories were inspired by Dodson's ideal child friend, Alice Liddell. Dodson first met Alice when she was only four years old. Nabokov developed an interest in Charles Dodson while studying at Cambridge. By the early 1920s, he had already completed a Russian translation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Although Nabokov esteemed Dodson the writer, he held deep reservations about Dodson, the historic person. During a 1966 interview, he acidly remarked, I always call him Lewis Carroll Carroll, because he was the first Humbert Humbert. Nabokov's disparaging reference to Dodson's wretched perversion strongly suggests he regarded this eminent Victorian as a pedophile. Photography became a popular new hobby during the Victorian era. Charles Dodson proved to be a very gifted amateur. Alice and the little children were an early focus of Dodson's output. In 1858, Dodson took an especially remarkable photograph of six-year-old Alice dressed up as a beggar maid. He posed Alice in a tattered urchin garment with both straps pushed down, leaving her shoulders exposed. The portrait is rather too mature and provocative for such a little girl. Nude studies of children were very popular in Victorian society. Semi-naked children, typically girls, happily adorned family albums, postcards and greeting cards dressed up as cherubs, angels, elves and fairy queens. Charles Dodgson began photographing nude children during the 1860s, setting them against a variety of painted landscapes. In a letter, Dodson indicated his strong preference for girls' physiques. I confess, I do not admire naked boys in pictures. They always seem to me to need clothes, whereas one hardly sees why the lovely forms of girls should ever be covered up. Further suspicions about Dodson's aesthetic tastes are raised by his overly alluring and seductive portrait of seven-year-old Beatrice Hatch. After unwelcome rumours began circulating about his hobby in 1881, Dodson destroyed the glass plates of his child nude studies by wiping them clean. In accordance with his final wishes, the executor of Dodson's estate burnt the surviving nude prints following his death. Lolita bears witness to Nabokov's jaundiced opinion of the Reverend's subterranean worlds. A breeze from Wonderland affects Humbert's sensibilities as he leers at his nymphette at the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel. Humbert's eye is mockingly compared to an alert periscope as he spies upon a half-naked nymphette stilled in the act of combing her Alice in Wonderland hair. Nabokov expressed great disdain for Dodgson's new child studies, accusing him of getting away with pederasty and nymphalepsy, like so many other Victorians. He strenuously denounced the real-life farces of a world that had condemned Oscar Wilde for flaunting a flamboyant perversion and getting caught, while Dodson had hidden his humble but much more evil little secret behind the emulsions of the developing room. Nabokov's under-evaluated critique of Carroll's fantasy fiction extended to chess. A chess game features as the frontispiece to Carroll's second Alice tale, Through the Looking Glass. Within that story, movements made by various characters, including Pawn Alice, the Red Queen and the White Knight, correspond to movements made on the board. Charles Dodson is commonly thought to be represented by the White Knight in the game. The plot line in Through the Looking Glass reaches a climax when Alice is crowned after reaching the end of the board. In Solving Nabokov's Lolita Riddle, Joanne Morgan has argued that Nabokov shadowed and parodied Through the Looking Glass at length within Ben Sinister. Metaphors involving passive pawns, 
cooked chess problems, rooks and kings abound within Ben Sinister. Adam Krug, the central character, is likened to a chess master. As the plot unfolds, an eight-year-old David is mistakenly admitted to an institute for abnormal children and sexually tormented by big boys. Like Through the Looking Glass, the novel reaches a crescendo when David is crowned, this time with a Turkish-style turban. Inspired by Lewis Carroll, Nabokov underpinned Ben Sinister with a chess strategy uniquely his own. Although he was a lifelong devotee of chess, Nabokov's real expertise lay in devising chess problems. Chess problems typically challenge expert solvers to checkmate the opposition in two or three moves. Via his Ben Sinister chess problem, Nabokov ingeniously engaged Lewis Carroll in a symbolic chess duel. In a letter sent to New Yorker editor Catherine White, Nabokov noted how the first edition of Alice in the Looking Glass carries a very subtle and difficult chess problem. He expressed hope New Yorker readers would find his own chess game less bewildering. Within Carroll's Looking Glass chess game, the opening move is made by the masculine-looking Red Queen who scampers away from Alice on a ladder-like trajectory ascending left to right. Within heraldry, such a diagonal is known as a bend sinister. Dodson's intense attachment to Alice has led some critics to interpret this trajectory, a la Freud, in sexual terms. One psychoanalyst boldly insisted the Red Queen somehow personified uncontrolled animal passions. Rather more cagely, in The White Knight, Scottish critic Alexander Taylor concluded Carol was not interested in the game as a game, but in the implications of the moves. Discernible patterns in Nabokov's writings suggest he too regarded the Red Queen's opening move, along with Alice's coronation scene, as implied threats to children's safety. As a stylist, Nabokov displayed a singular talent for building interactive patterns between his novels, memoirs and chess problems. Nabokov discussed his Ben Sinister chess problem at some length in his memoirs. There he strongly hinted the problem contained an encoded message. The bishop, he explained, was a metaphor for a searchlight, whereas the knight was likened to an adjustable lever, a tool typically used to pry things open. The prospect of deciphering Nabokov's unorthodox code was guaranteed by the author's assurance that the normally censoring controller had finally allowed vital pieces of information to escape so that the hidden meaning of his chess symbols might be divulged. To unlock Nabokov's anti-Wonderland chess code, we need to assume the pawn represents a child, the knight a child predator, and the bishop a protective guardian or parent. We must also take heed of Nabokov's suspicions regarding the Red Queen's opening move and Alice's coronation. In Nabokov's Bend Sinister Chess Problem, two pawns face imminent danger of being queened. The white pawn is one square away, whereas the black pawn is two squares from its coronation. Should the black pawn advance to the end of the board, it is in danger of being molested by the Black Knight. The clever solution to Nabokov's problem relies on White avoiding the temptation of queening the pawn. Instead, it must propel the searchlight bishop into action. By impeding the Black Pawn's advance, the bishop ensures the incestuous rendezvous with the knight can never take place. Regardless of what Black does next, White achieved checkmate on the next move. The subtle child protection agenda advanced by Nabokov's anti-Wonderland strategy is reinforced by the bishop's protective move, which reverses the Red Queen's ithyphallic trajectory, affecting a form of symbolic castration. The commentary Nabokov provides within Speak Memory about his Ben Sinister chess problem lends weight to Morgan's decoding analysis. 
There we find Nabokov admitting his chess strategy involved an unusual line of defense, which might provide a glimpse of the actual configuration of men. The gender challenge raised by Nabokov's spectacular defense is further reinforced by the author's arcane alchemical expectation that his efforts would somehow hasten the wedding of a new couple via sacred fire. Centuries ago, the alchemists sought to forge an everlasting union between mind and body and male and female essences within their ancient laboratories. In the closing discussion, devoted to his chess strategy, Nabokov mysteriously anticipated that this exalted marital state would one day compensate him for the misery of the deceit. <laughs>